Well, good morning, Walden Church. This is our second week together talking through the Holy Spirit. You know, we've been going through the book of Acts and talking about the Holy Spirit, and I just thought, you know, we should just make this our entire fall study. And so uh, that's where we are, and I want to begin this by telling a very uh, amusing, uh, silly story. Uh, Pastor Tony Evans, in one of his books, he has this story about uh, a couple who goes to an appliance store and they see this ultimate refrigerator. I mean, it's huge. It's got all the bells and whistles. Is it everything you'd expect? It's got a computer that thinks for you and it orders uh, your food and it uh, keeps a shopping list for you and it remembers uh, which items you're out of stock on and it uh, has this uh, nice soft light when you open the door. It's, it's calming, it's relaxing. It remembers to feed the cat and lock all the doors of your house. And of course, it costs thousands of dollars. It costs way more than your standard GE refrigerator. And you're so impressed though, you buy it anyway. And then they deliver the newfangled refrigerator to your house. You get so excited. You put all your favorite food inside of it and you go to bed. And the next morning when you wake up, you discover that all your food has soured and spoiled and, and gone rotten. Everything's been wilted. Uh, your vegetables have changed colors. Your refrigerator is not working, basically. And so you call the appliance store and, and you say, hey, I don't understand uh, what happened, but my refrigerator doesn't seem to be working. And the guy on the phone says, well, open the door. So you open the door. And he says, did the light come on? I said, no, there's no light. He says, all right, tell you what, put, put your ear to the refrigerator door and tell me if you can hear the hum of the motor. I say, yeah, I don't, I don't hear any hum. He says, all right, if you go around and look at the back side of the refrigerator, there's a cord and just check to see if it's plugged into the wall. And you go around back there and lo and behold, it's not plugged in. So you say to the salesman, you're right, the cord wasn't plugged in. But you know, I paid so much money for this refrigerator, it shouldn't matter. Like the refrigerator should be smart enough to understand that it's not plugged in, it should tell me that it's not plugged in or it should plug itself in. And the guy on the phone says, no, that's, that's still not how appliances work. I mean, they can be smart, they can be powerful, they can do all these great things, but at the end of the day, it still needs to get plugged in. Unless you plug that refrigerator in, it won't have any power. Now, that seems obvious to you and me and we can, laugh and think that the person who bought it was silly, but it states a very obvious truth that we want to make about the Holy Spirit today, is that no matter how much you love your refrigerator and how expensive it was, it's not going to work unless you plug it in. And neither will you. Your Christian life is designed to be plugged in to the power of the Holy Spirit. So how important then is the Holy Spirit to you? How important is the Holy Spirit in your life? Because I think it's sad. It's sad because I think this is an element of God that we neglect. It's an aspect of God that we don't study. We don't pray to. We don't tap into. Did you know that without the Holy Spirit, there is no creation of the world? Right? So if there's no creation of the world, there's also no... Uh, human life, right? There's no humanity because we know that the Holy Spirit lives in us. There would also be no Christmas story without the Holy Spirit. Without the Holy Spirit, there'd be no Christians. There'd be no Bible. There'd be no triumph over sin. There'd be no looking forward to the return of Jesus. So I think if that's the case, then we need to study this more seriously. What do you think? Ephesians 3 says, according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being. And so if the Holy Spirit is this inner power, if it's this power source, if it's this strength, then we should be trying to figure out how to plug into that power. Because it's with that power in our lives that makes the difference, that changes us. So that when people look at us, they notice and they say, wow, you are different. 
What has gotten into you? What is this? When we're reading these stories in the book of Acts, we're examining how the church moved, the things the church did, and maybe you're like me. Maybe you read these stories and you think to yourself, wow, this is so incredible. You read these stories of the early church and you see what they experience and what they do, what they can accomplish, and you think, that is so amazing, so incredible. You see them tap in to the Spirit's power. You watch God move through the early church. It's incredible. And so I think this is why. This is why a study like this is so important. Because I think for many Christians, we feel like we're down here, right? We're down here, and we're working with less than Jesus. We're working with less. We're working with less than the disciples had. Sure, the disciples changed the world. Sure, the disciples did great things, but that's because they had Jesus. But Jesus didn't leave us to put us into a worse situation. In fact, Jesus says that he gave us the Spirit for our betterment. Jesus says in John 16, nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. If I do not go away, the helper will not come to you, but if I go, I will send him to you. Have you ever thought that having access to the Holy Spirit was to your advantage? Why not? This is what Jesus himself says. He says it, so we should believe it. So just to recap a little bit, you know, on the very first page of Acts, Luke begins by telling us that after Jesus is resurrected, He hangs out. He stays. He stays for 40 days. Acts 1-4 says, while they were staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So Jesus dies, and he comes back to life, And that certainly would make you want to run next door and tell your friends, right? But Jesus says, wait, 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 before you do that, before you rush off, before you start telling people, I mean, I know this is incredible news and you want to share it, but right now, all you have is your own strength. And so I want you to wait because I have something that I want to give you first. Ooh, what is it, Jesus? What what are you going to, what are you going to give us? Jesus says, I'm going to give you my power. The power of the Holy Spirit, which is the power of God, right? And he says, before, you were just baptized with water, but I'm going to drench you. I'm going to cover you. I'm going to saturate you with the power of the Holy Spirit. So naturally, this makes them inquisitive, and they ask, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Oh, 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 Jesus, I know, I know. This is end times, right? They say, this is the end times. And he says, no, 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 (laughs) no. He says, don't, don't don't change the subject. No, you're gonna receive power, Jesus says and you're gonna be my witnesses all over the world. So the disciples gather, and they wait, they wait. Next chapter, Acts chapter two. When the day of Pentecost arrived, now Pentecost is the Greek word for 50. It's the 50th day after Passover. That's what Pentecost means. They were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, And it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So the Bible says that they're all in one place. And um, well, who are they? Who who are the they that are all together in one place? We, We would think, oh, it's the 12 disciples, right? It's the 12 disciples. No, it was the church. This was the early church, Acts 1.15 says that it was 120 people. Did you know that? Acts 1.14.15 says all these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. 
In those days, Peter stood up among the brothers, and the company of persons was in about 120. 120 people, men, women, all sitting together, all waiting for the gift of Jesus, and suddenly, the sound of a hurricane, they look up, they see flames of fire dancing over each one of them, and then, all of a sudden, they all have the ability to speak different languages. French, Chinese, English. Verse 5 says, Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at the sound, the multitude came together, and they were bewildered, because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all of these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each one of us in his own native language? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians. We hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty work of God. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? What does this mean? They ask. You see, this is how we know that it's a supernatural event. Because the church is doing something that they would not be otherwise able to do on their own. The crowd is watching and they are shocked. The Bible uses words like amazed and perplexed. So let me ask you something. If a non-believer walked in off the street today and sat down in our church, or any church, any church in America, would they be amazed and perplexed by what they saw? Is it amazing when people are nice to you and they say good morning? Is it amazing when people sing songs together while reading off a screen? Is someone standing and delivering a positive message from a stage a perplexing event? What is the church of 2020 doing that is amazing and perplexing to the outside world? Jesus said of the church, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do, because I am going to the Father. Jesus said that the future church would do greater works than he did. The church of Jesus has a call to be amazing and perplexing. The crowds in Acts 2 hear the early church preaching the gospel, each in their own language, men and women from Galilee, and they're speaking Arabic. They're speaking Egyptian. They're speaking Chinese. And it's shocking. It'd be like you going into a French restaurant and the waiter comes over to the table and all of a sudden your spouse starts ordering in French. What's going on? You ask, amazed and perplexed. You don't speak French. This is the promised power of Jesus that the church would have. He rose from the dead and the church wanted to rush out and tell everyone and Jesus wanted them to wait until they had this extra ability that would enable the gospel message to go even further. Why? Zechariah 4, 6, It's not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. It's not for us to take any of the credit. So when the crowd asks, what is this all about? Peter tells them in verse 36. Verse 36 says, Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The people look up to Peter, and they say, what does this mean? And Peter says, it means Jesus. 
right? He says it means Jesus. This power that you see that we have, this ability that you see that we can do, it's not us, he says. It's Jesus. And the Bible says the crowd was convinced that was enough. That convinced them. That's all it took for an unbelieving world to become believing. The Bible says the crowd was cut to the heart. And Peter adds, and if you want to be a part of what we are doing, and if you would like to be a part of something bigger than yourself, you can join us. How? How can we join you? Peter says, repent and be baptized. And if you repent and are baptized, you can have this same power. What about you? Do you have this power? You know, Billy Graham once said, man has two great spiritual needs. One is forgiveness, and the other is goodness. God heard that first cry for help, that cry for forgiveness, and he answered it at Calvary. But God also heard our second cry, that cry for goodness, and he answered it at Pentecost. You can say that Jesus met our need for eternal life, and the Holy Spirit meets our need for the internal life. Remember, the Holy Spirit is in you. And when you go home this week, I want you to read Romans chapter 8. And if you're home right now, I want you to read Romans chapter 8 on your own, and, and, and we'll talk more about it. But Paul writes to the Romans church in verse 9, You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If, in fact, the Spirit of God dwells in you, anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who dwells in you. Paul is very clear here. The Spirit of God dwells in you. And consequently, if the Spirit doesn't dwell in you, you are not a Christian. Well, I don't know. That's not what I was taught. I was always taught that there were Bible churches and then there were Spirit-led churches. In Bible churches, you sing with serious faces and we never raise our hands, we never shout, and our sermons are always straight from the Bible. In a spirit-led church, they shout and yell and raise their hands. I don't know where that came from, because the early church was both. They read from the prophets and the disciples, and they were fueled by the fire of the Holy Spirit. And that enabled them to spread the gospel and grow the kingdom. Listen, I don't want people to mistakenly think that we're a Bible church nor do I want people to mistakenly think that we're a spirit church, as if they can be separated. Deuteronomy 6.4 says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. And the church is the bride of Christ. End of story. We belong to him. It's his church. It's his community. It's his kingdom. In fact, Paul has a great analogy as to how we should think of ourselves and our relationship to the Spirit. Romans 8 continues, it says, If Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who dwells in you. The Bible says, before your life in Christ, you were dead in sin. You were lifeless. You were a corpse. And corpses don't come back to life by themselves. Paul says, good news. The same Holy Spirit that brought Jesus back to life will bring you back to life. And now you are new. You are a new creation. Paul goes on in verse 12. So then, brothers, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh, for if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. 
For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we might also be glorified with him. You see, the Holy Spirit fills you. And when you become a Christian, your old life is put to death. Paul says it's a choice. You either put your sin to death or it kills you. It's kill or be killed. And I think a lot of us, we get tipped up right here. As Christians, we are stuck right here on the starting block. Our game piece is still on go because our sin and our old life trips us up and we don't understand about the power that is available to us to live a free life. Paul calls this living according to the flesh. When Paul writes, he says that the flesh is dead. The flesh, he says, is hostile to God and it does not submit to God's law. How do you know? How do you know if you're one or the other? Well, I think those who live according to the flesh live selfishly. They look inwards. They serve themselves. They act in a way that puts their life and their goals first. If a person's nature is the spirit, they tend to live and act in ways that love and glorify Christ. They live their lives looking outward. They serve others. Our ambitions drive our energy and our time. What we give our thoughts to, what we give our resources to, that is who we are, flesh or spirit. That nature drives you and it's revealed by what you do. And the mindset, the lifestyle, the difference between flesh and spirit, Paul says is the same. The importance level, the same as life and death. And if it's that important, right? If it's that important, the Christian and the church needs to be filled with the word, the truth, with Jesus and the spirit. Paul says both, both are in you, both are important, both benefit you, both add to you. What do they give you? Paul tells us, he gives us two ifs. Two ifs in chapter 8. Verse 10 says, But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. So if Christ is in you, your sin is replaced by righteousness. And the second is found in the next verse, verse 11. If the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. And if that spirit dwells in you, he will raise you from this mortal life and make you fit for heaven. Last week, we said that the first job of the Holy Spirit was to convict the world of sin. And you know, I think that that work takes place before somebody ever walks through the doors of the church. I don't think anyone who walks through these doors not knowing that their life needs to change. So we don't always need a preacher to stand up on a stage and to lecture us that we're all sinners or that we need to uh, make a change in our life. I think the person who comes knows they need a next step. And that is a life filled with Jesus and forgiveness of that sin. And that a life filled with the Spirit equips them to carry the gospel out and it prepares them for the kingdom to come. That is the truth that the church needs to share. Why? Because the world outside says that it's just about being good, living a good life. And then if you live a good life, you'll get rewarded. But we all know that's not true. It's impossible, isn't it? It's impossible to live a good life. We, we can never be good enough. The crowd saw Peter and the early church 
preaching the gospel, and the Bible says they were cut to the heart. And they said, what's the next step? Right? We've been convicted. Now tell us what to do. The Spirit had already done his first job, convicted the crowd of their sin, and what was Peter's message? Repent and be baptized. Repentance means I want to stop going my own way, and now I want to go God's way. The way I live was shown to me. It's no longer acceptable. I can't continue to ignore God in my life. And I must have more. I have to have more of God in my life. Just like the hymn says, I surrender all, right? Just like the hymn says, I will trust and obey. There's no other way. If that message, if that message is cutting to your heart and it's working in your life right now, that is the work of the Holy Spirit, convicting you and bringing you to truth. But if it's still that pesky sin life that keeps tripping us up, it's that language of old life and new life that worries us and we have doubts. Don't worry. We, we all do it. We all have those same doubts. One last thing Paul writes next in verse 15. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit himself bears witness with our spirit, that we are children of God. As a Christian, the Holy Spirit lives inside of you, and he speaks to your soul. That's what it says. And, and when the Spirit speaks to your soul, he reassures you of what? Of your adoption, of your heirship. And therein lies another job of the Holy Spirit. He convicts the world of sin. He leads people to truth. He illuminates Jesus through worship. And the Spirit confirms that we are in the family. When you become a Christian, the depth of your soul finds a home and extended arms reach upward in need and you cry out, Daddy, I need you. And the Spirit comes into your life and tells you that your daddy loves you and that your daddy wants you to succeed. Listen, living by the Spirit means being a son and daughter of the kingdom and there's nothing you can't do. Remember, Jesus promised that we would do greater works than him. Jesus promised that with faith, we could toss a mountain into the sea. Church, Christians don't live fearful lives. We don't live defeated lives. We live lives that are different than our neighbors. So when the outside world looks at us, they are amazed and perplexed. And they ask, what is this? Because Christians don't fit in. And that means a Christian church doesn't fit in. And Christian churches don't fit in because we're filled with the Holy Spirit. And that Holy Spirit changes lives. Your life, your old life, is dead. And your new life is forever different. The Holy Spirit rests above your head in a flame, and now you are empowered to do things that you never thought before were possible. This is why Paul so famously says in Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And if today you say, I believe in Jesus, then the Holy Spirit will live in you and God will radically change your life. And, and then you'll tell other people, your life can be different too. You can have this power. That's what it's supposed to be about. When the crowd says, brothers, what shall we do? Peter said to them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Spirit. Repent means admit you're a sinner. And there's no shame in admitting that. If heaven were a reward for perfect people, none of us would go. Romans 3 says all have sinned and continue to fall short of God's glory. And guess what? Once you decide to follow Jesus, you're still not perfect. But right now, that's what a church is. It's you sitting amongst people who are like you, faults and all. Remember, a church is a family. 
A family that's made up of people who are imperfect and who are broken and who are hurting, but a family who comes together and loves Jesus, believes in Jesus for the forgiveness of their sins. And if you believe that God became a man, that he walked among us, if you believe that Jesus came to show us what things like peace and grace and hope look like, and if you believe that Jesus stands ready to offer you a new beginning and a new life, Jesus is the key. Acts 4.12 says there is no salvation by anyone else. There is no other name under heaven given among people by which they can be saved. You can admit that you're a sinner. You can believe that Jesus is the king. And then the Bible says you just need to confess it. You confess Jesus as your savior. Romans 10 says if you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And a new life and a new beginning is just that easy. And if you're ready for that, then I would invite you to bow your heads and pray this prayer. Dear God, thank you for sending your son Jesus so that I could be your friend. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for being with me all my life, even when I didn't know it. And I realize I need a savior to set me free from sin, from myself, and from all the habits and hurts and hangups that mess up my life. I ask you to forgive me of my sin. I want to repent and live the way you created me to live. Be the Lord of my life. Save me with your grace. I want to learn to love you and trust you. And I want to become everything you made me to be. Thank you for creating me. Thank you for choosing me to be a part of your family. Amen. Now, if you prayed that prayer, my next challenge to you is to plug in. Plug into a church. Plug into a church close to you. A community church. A neighborhood church. A church that you can drive to in a couple of minutes. Plug in with people who you live amongst. Worship with people in your neighborhood. Serve your community. Find a group of believers that you can look at and say, you are like me and I am like you, and give back. And as you give, you will be poured into. Tell someone at that church, tell the pastor of that church, I became a Christian this week. Have somebody hold you accountable and then continue to come, continue to attend, continue to pour out your life, and you will find that the more you pour your life out, the more your life will be filled. Thank you for watching. If you feel like this video could help somebody else, or you know somebody that uh, this could speak to, you could just clip and copy the address, the YouTube URL up at the top. You could post it to their social media wall, or you could just post this video to your social media wall to let other people know uh, the things that you're thinking about and processing Thanks for watching, guys. I love you, and I'll see you next week. Bye.